Hello everyone, my name is Halsey. Welcome to another Sunday School lesson where we give an overview of the lessons based on the precepts for living commentary. Don't forget to give a thumbs up, to share, to subscribe, or even to leave a comment. So this lesson is the fourth lesson in Unit 2 of our spring quarter. And the theme for this quarter is Beyond the Present Time. All the lessons in April has been focusing on Resurrection Hope. Bible scripture for today, Sunday, April 26, will be taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through verses 18. And then skip to chapter 5, verses 1 to verses 11. The lesson title is Living with Hope. Before we get started in our lesson, let's have prayer. Our Father and our God, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you sent him to die on a awful, terrible, horrible cross just so he could save us from the penalty of sin. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you for raising him up on the third day. Thank you, Lord, for giving him all power, power that overcomes death, hell, and the grave. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we are positioned in him. Thank you that our hope, the hope that we have is guaranteed and it is secure in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that because of what Jesus did for us, we have a citizenship in heaven. And for that, we say thank you. Bless every teachers. Give them strength. Give hope. Give peace. Bless every listeners. Continue, Lord, to open up their ears to hear and their hearts to receive. Thank you, Lord, that you and you alone can let us see the hope that we have in Jesus and help us to take hold of it. And we say thank you. We give you praise for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This lesson is outlined and it is divided into four sections. Section one will deal with those who have fallen asleep and that's first Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through verses 18. Section 2 will deal with the day of the Lord and that's first Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 through verses 3. Section 3 will deal with children of darkness versus children of the light and that's verses 4 through verses 6. Section 4 will deal with walking in readiness and that's verses 7 through verses 11. The aim for this lesson is that uh, we understand that we will understand the significance of the second coming of Christ that we will rejoice in our salvation and that we will determine determine to be prepared for the return of the Lord before we go into our lesson, let's add some background. So the Apostle Paul was writing to the Christians in Thessalonica who seems to might have been struggling with false teachings, rumors, and, and fears. Based on, based on this chapter, we will see that there was some struggling going on. And so in response to their struggling, the Apostle Paul had to uh, write to them to explain to them. So in our lesson today, we'll see how the Apostle Paul, he explained to the Thessalonians Christians that, that because the day of the Lord would come as a thief in the night, they were to live as though they expected Christ to return at any moment now. That the Christian were they were struggling with what happened to a believer who died before Jesus uh, returned. And Paul here he, ex he encourages them 
encourages them not to grieve, not to grieve as the unbelievers grieve. They were to have hope that when Jesus returned, he would resurrect uh, the bodies of every Christian and that those who die ahead of time, their bodies would be resurrected first. And for those who remain, those who are still alive, they will be caught up to be with him. In the last uh, part of chapter 4, which is where our lesson picks up, uh, Paul here, he called upon the Thessalonians, uh, Christians, to use these truths for their encouragement. And Paul, he continues to address those concerns that were are plaguing these Christians, which was uh, heavily rooted in the misconceptions of the end time, the day of the Lord, and what would happen to uh, those who had died uh, before Christ's return. We will now go into section one, and it will deal with those who have fallen asleep. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13, reading from New Living Translations, says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. And here we see how Paul, he made this very specific, he said, we want you to know what happened to the believers. This hope right here is not for unbelievers. This is for the believers who die in Christ. And sadly to say, there are many who will take hold of going to heaven and refuses to believe in Jesus Christ. Paul here is talking to those who put their trust in Jesus Christ and believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. This is not for everybody right here. This is for the believers. And apparently these believers here, they were wondering what happens to Christians who died before Jesus returned. And they were troubled by the fact that these believers might miss the victory and the blessings of Jesus' coming. Verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Do you notice how Paul kept saying the believers, the, this hope right here is for those who have given their life to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Verse 15, we tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. And here you see how Paul, he made it very clear of what happens to any Christians when he or she dies. And in other scriptures, uh, Paul even give a more a clearer understanding. If we go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and start looking at from verse 1, it says, For, when we, for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down when we die and leave those bodies we will have a home in heaven an eternal body made for us by god himself and not by human hands and so paul here lets us know that uh, when we died our physical bodies remain in the earth slowly decaying away but our spirits go immediately to be with the Lord. And here in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and continue in verse 3, say, For we will not be spirits without bodies, but we will put on new heavenly bodies. For 
our dying bodies makes us groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and have, have no bodies at all. We want to slip into our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by everlasting life. Verse 5, God himself has prepared for this and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. Back to the lesson, verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. And so the concern, the main concern for the Thessalonian Christians were they were they wanted to know. They wanted to know if those who died before the Lord would before the Lord returned, if they would miss out on the glorious events of the coming of the Lord. And Paul here let them know that that answer would be no. If we have already died. God will raise up our bodies into glorified bodies and take us along with Jesus as he returned for the Christians who remain on earth. And we also notice that uh, he also, Paul also uses the, the term sleep. And in, in ancient times, uh, the word sleep, that was a common term for them to use to express death. And, and amongst the, the, the pagan, the pagan did not see it this way. It was almost always seen as, as an eternal sleep, as no hope. You're, you're gone. There's no return. But in the Christian community, sleeping carries a different meaning. Sleeping, resting, same thing, waiting for Jesus to come back. And, and apparently this was the false teaching or the, 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 the wandering away that the Thessalonians uh, were getting about death and what happens uh, before Jesus' return. Because if they were thinking about it in the way the pagans were thinking about it, yes, it would be like without hope. But here Paul gives a reminder to these uh, Christians that he taught them about the hope of Jesus Christ and for them not to be ignorant about it because they knew. He, he told them about uh, what happened when believers die in Christ. Verse 17, Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Verse 18, so encourage each other with these words. And so here in these verses, Paul let us know that, you know, we should have more than just wishful thinking. We should have resurrection hope. And Jesus himself, his resurrection, I should serve as an example of the promise of our resurrection, our resurrected body. Paul here goes on uh, to encourage the troubled mind of the Thessalonians that Jesus, uh, when he comes back, that he will bring back with him all the faithfuls, all those who believed in him for the forgiveness of their sins. He will bring them back. Those that uh, were departed uh, before, he will bring them back with him. When he comes back, that means uh, we too, we too should take uh, time out right here and to think about what Paul is saying. Everybody is not going to heaven. Paul here is talking about those who have put their lives and, and, and asked Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. And we need to uh, seriously see the urgency right here that the, the ones that we're connected to who are not yet come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, 
this is not for them and we need to get the message out. If this is an urgency right here for those who have not yet come to a Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, there is no hope for them. Until they come to Jesus Christ and ask for the forgiveness of their sins and surrender their lives to him, this is not for them. They have nothing to expect, nothing to look forward to, but eternal death. This right here is an, is an emergency because only faith in Jesus Christ gives hope. And that is why Paul says earlier that believers are not to grieve the way unbelievers grieve. They're grieving because there's no hope for them. They are heading to eternal punishment because the wrath of God still remains. Again, if we notice in verse 18, Paul says, so encourage each other with these words. We, we are to encourage one another with the promise, the, with these promises of God, the promise of our living hope, the truth that Jesus will one day return. And Jesus himself lets us know over and over again that he's the way. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. This is the living hope that we have. Those of us that surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, this is the living hope that we have. We're not waiting until we die to go to heaven. This is the, We have this hope now. And for those who are not in him, they have no hope. This is what we need to make sure that we are letting those that are connected to us know. I'll keep saying it. Those who are not saved, they have no hope. And when they die, I don't care what, what pastors or whomever is giving them their eulogy. I don't care what they say. And if they did not receive Christ before they die, stop putting them in heaven. This is when we need to be telling them, come to Jesus now before it's too late. And again, remember Jesus said in John 14, in verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Did you hear that? Nobody can go back to a holy God except through Jesus Christ. As the way, Jesus is our path to the Father. As the truth, he is the reality of all God's promises. And as the life, he joins his life. Jesus Christ joins his divine life to ours, both now and eternally. That is why he is our way. So therefore, anyone who is not in him do not have any hope. They don't have any hope because this is how we have hope because we're joined with him in his divine life. That's what gives us that hope and that eternal hope. So our job is to let those that have not yet come to him, let them know the terrible, terrible disaster and calamity that awaits them. The judgment of God that awaits them because the wrath of God still remains. We will now go to section two. And it will deal with the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 through verses 3. Verse 1. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. And we, we here we see how Paul continues uh, to write and to teach about readiness, readiness for Christ's return. And he implies here that the, the Thessalonians Christian, they were well taught about the return of Christ. Even, even, even though Paul did not stay long with them, they were told, they were given prophecies and they were told about the seasons and the return of Jesus Christ. So they, it's not like they were in the dark. They were told. 
Verse 2, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. And here Paul used a commonly used phrase uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the day of the Lord. And it, it has the idea, the idea behind it is, is that this will be God's time. The day of the Lord reflect only God's time, God's doing. And uh, the final out outcome of the day of the Lord, it will be that the arrogance of men, the arrogance of men will be brought down low and the pride of men will be humbled. The day of the Lord, the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And the ultimate, the ultimate or final fulfillment of these prophecies concerning the day of the Lord will come at the end of history when God with his wondrous power will punish evil and fulfill all his promises. And Jesus Christ will be that ultimate fulfillment. Verse 3, when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor of pains begin and there will be no escape. And, and here the idea is that we should not waste time. Don't waste time trying to figure out uh, when Jesus is coming back. Instead, we should, we should be thinking about our own standing and thinking about those that uh, surrounds us who have not yet come to the knowledge of Christ, who have refused uh, to believe and, and receive Jesus as their savior. Paul here gives a vivid picture of what is to come. That sudden destruction, that unexpected uh, destruction that is coming. And again, this will be a nightmare. This will be a nightmare for all unbelievers when it will be too late. That sudden destruction that has no escape. And they shall hear that frightening verdict of no escape, nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. And it will happen when many will say or think that time, oh, we're in a peaceful time. We're, we're having safety and, and peacefully. And then they will have that sudden destruction that they have no, no time, don't even have time to repent. Sudden. And listen to what the Apostle Paul likened this sudden uh, pain to and destruction to. A woman in labor, as a labor pain come up on a pregnant woman. And this, this suggested uh, the inevitable. The inevitable is coming. The unexpected is coming. You know, no one will ever have an excuse Jesus himself gave a calling. He gave an invitation in Revelation uh, chapter 3 and verse 20. He said, look, here I stand at the door and knock. If you hear me calling and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal as friends. And here Jesus was talking to a church that felt uh, self-satisfied that was complacent they felt peace and safety and self-satisfied but they did not have the presence of Christ with them and Jesus Christ gave an invitation he said Christ says knock here I am I'm at the door I'm knocking on your hearts open up your hearts and answer me and I'll come in but they were so busy enjoying the world's pleasure, just like where we are today. There's a whole bunch that is out there in this dark world, enjoying the world's pleasure and not noticing that they are empty and that they have no hope and that they're heading to a terrible day of the Lord. We will now go to section three. It will deal with children of darkness versus children of light and that's verse four through verse six verse four but you aren't in the dark about these things dear brothers and sisters 
and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. And Paul here, he addresses uh, the believer's behaviors. He talked about walking in the newness of God as sons of the light. As sons of the light, we are to walk in the newness of our new life. Meaning the time when uh, we were in the darkness, we were of the past life. And the past life would represent no hope. Now that we are in, in the new life, now that we are in Christ, we would have nothing to be afraid of approaching the day of the Lord. So our job now is to tell unbelievers of God's redemptive plan for salvation. Verse 5, for you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. And here Paul continues to give reminders for all believers, because we're now in the light, we're now in the, the light, because we do not belong to night any longer. Our spiritual condition should never be marked by sleep. We should be watching with a sober mind. We should not be complacent. He said we should not be sleep, and, and sleep here carries the idea of not walk in ignorance, not walk in laziness. Don't be, don't be complacent. And so, uh, in other words, Paul here wants us to line ourselves up with our identity. We identify with Christ. We are not to be identified with unbelievers who sleep, who just aimlessly wandering along. Here Paul, he made it very clear that there are others, those who sleep, those who have not believed the revelation of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who do not believe, they are the one who are asleep as it relates to the day of the Lord. We are not to be like that. We are to be alert and sober-minded, looking to meet our Savior. We will now go to section four. It will deal with walking in readiness. Verse seven through verse 11. Verse seven. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. Verse eight. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith, and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. And here now we see how uh, Paul included himself. He said us. And he goes on to use uh, military terms so that his readers would understood what he was saying. He used the image of a soldier's armor to illustrate the idea of being watchful. So think about it. A soldier is, is a good example of someone who must watch and be sobered. And also they're equipped to do, to fight, to do what uh, they need to do with their armor. So they are equipped to fight. They're ready. He also here, he used faith and love to represent uh, the breastplate because the breastplate would covers the vital organs. No soldier, no soldiers uh, sh would, should or would ever go uh, to battle without his or her breastplate. Likewise, no believers, no Christians is equipped to live this Christian life without faith and love. Goes on to talks about wearing the helmet of confidence of our salvation. 
the hope that we have, the hope of salvation, it represents the helmet. Because the helmet protects the head. And spiritually speaking, it protects the mind. You, you remember what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 1 and 2. In Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, he said, and, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, be the kind he will accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is, is this too much to ask? Don't copy the behavior and custom of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by the changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. The mind, the renewal of the mind. When our minds, when our spiritual minds are, are renewed in the word of God, it will help us to have that confidence that we need, that expectation that we need of God's faithfulness to all his promises by the renewing of our minds, by the transforming of our minds, we will know what that good and pleasing, perfect will of God really is. Back to the lesson, verse 9. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. And here Paul continues to talk about the security of believers' future in Christ. Before we had a hope of salvation, we had appointment of God's punishment and God's wrath. But here Paul says, we no longer have this appointment, but we now have obtained salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ deliver us from the wrath of God. I will say it again, without Jesus Christ intervening and standing in the middle of us and God, the wrath of God still remains. Only Jesus Christ, Paul, here he said it again, Jesus Christ is the one who stands in the middle of us and God. He is our mediator. He's the one who took the brunt of God's punishment for us. If Jesus didn't uh, take this punishment, the appointment would still await us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. This is the message that we need to pass on to this dark and dying world that the wrath of God still remains. Without Jesus Christ standing in the gap for us, the wrath of God still stand. We who are now in Christ don't have to look forward to that appointment, but every unbeliever, it awaits them, and we need to let them know. And Paul continues to let us know that the unity that we have with Christ, it cannot be broken. So whether we are dead or alive, when he comes back, we will always be with him. Because when he died, he took our place of punishment. Again, thank you, Jesus. And so as we close, what can we take away? What are we able to take away from uh, Paul's uh, letter to the Thessalonians Christians? Well, for one, the Apostle Paul, he gives that assurance that promises uh, Christ's return and that his return provides us with comfort and hope. He lets us know that we are to live as though we expect Jesus to return any moment, any day now. We should expect him to come. Be watchful, be sober-minded, and be an alert. He also let us know that we can, we can comfort someone who, someone who are anxious. 
who are anxious about their daily occurrence, the, the, the things of this world. And we can do so by sharing the peace and joy and hope of Jesus Christ. We are able to share this with unbelievers who have not yet come to the knowledge of Christ. And so as we go through this week, let us have an aim. Let us have an aim to hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, knowing that this Jesus that we believe in, he is faithful to all his promises. Let us have an aim to share this living hope with someone who are not saved to come to Jesus now before it is too late and they have to face God's anger at the day of the Lord. And this will conclude this week's lesson. If you have heard something that was helpful to you, please give a thumbs up, share, subscribe, or even to leave a comment. But most importantly, remember we are building the kingdom of God together one lesson at a time. God bless you until next time. Bye-bye.